Welcome back to Arm Crossfire with Espy and Gabi. Start yeah. off by, uh, hey. Drop. Yeah, we're back. So, guys, as usual, recognizing our sponsors. First one being Smirnoff Ice. Got yours today, Gabi? You know what? They're a proud supporter of Arm Crossfire. And then we've got ReadyGo.ca. And of course, with ReadyGo.ca, we've got another contest going on for the month of October. In the month of October is a caption contest. So go to ReadyGo.ca, click on the About Us tab, scroll to the bottom, and you'll see the Arm Crossfire contest. There's a photo there. They're looking for their best possible saying, and the winner will get the $40 coupon code plus 10% off for life from ReadyGo.ca, and their name will be on the shirt. So this is a shirt design, so keep that in mind. And, uh, yeah, right on. Thank you very much, ReadyGo.ca. I see you're wearing your uh, ReadyGo garb shirt. Yes, sir. Again, mine's in the wash. Patreon, Tier 1 members, Brandon Irwin and Yorn Herald Haybu, butchering that name as usual, and Sean Russell himself at Tier 2. Thank you, you guys, the ones watching on YouTube for this video. Take the time to hit subscribe down in the corner. Uh, we appreciate the support, and we need to get our subscription count up there. So if you like the show, hit subscribe. All right, Gobby, just me and you. We got uh, we do have Mr. Paul Passmore joining us shortly. But for now, we have some predictions to do. And it's going to be interesting because this is a smaller Supermatch card at the Fit to Fight Arm Sport League coming up October the 5th in Saskatoon. And I want to hear your thoughts on some of these matches. Absolutely. So I'm going to throw these names out there, and I want you to tell me uh, if you have, first of all, if you know who these girls are, and if you have a prediction on them. Brittany Sutherland. Never heard of her. Never heard of her. Brittany Sutherland is from Manitoba. She was one of the stars of the Arm Nation TV show. Uh, very talented. She is the title holder over there in uh, the Fit to Fight Arm Sports League in the women's middleweight class. And she's defending her right arm belt against Melanie Hoffland. No, it's all Greek. No, right no sir. Okay, man. I'm going to say that uh, Brittany's probably the favorite to win here. Much more experience, much more experience. Many time provincial champion and not quite national yet, but she will be someday. She's. Uh, Finished as high as silver, I believe, at the national championships. So I think she's the favorite in the match. Uh, best of five, I believe. And I think it's going to be Brittany winning that three matches to one. Nice. Now, I definitely know you know who these guys are. First of all, let me tell you. You know who Kyle Schwartz is? No. Okay, well, there's a, there is a left arm lightweight belt. And Kyle is the challenger. The champion is Dustin Leach. Oh, okay. Dusty. Yeah. So, best of five, who takes it? Well, I don't know the other guy. I know Dustin very well. Um, I've pulled him both arms. Um, right arm only, I think. I know he's right dominant. He's very, very quick, very aggressive, um, very tight setup. Um, I don't know. Like, I have to go with him 3 nothing. I don't know the other guy, and I know Dustin is a... Yeah, I don't, I don't know Kyle very well. Um, but I know Dustin, and I know he's a killer. Yeah. So we're flipping that around, and we're going to see his. We're going to see Kelly, his brother, right arm against Kyle. So Kyle's actually pulling each of the Leach brothers uh, with opposing arms. So Kelly Leach versus Kyle Schwartz, right arm, lightweight belt. It also seems like um, Schwartz is pulling each each of the brothers' weaker arm, which bodes better for him. I think Kelly's left on, dominant. And I think Dustin is uh, Dusty's right. Uh, dominant, I believe. I could be wrong. Kelly could be very equal though, I mean, with with both his hands. So um, he better he better pack his lunch with Kelly. That's that's a he's a tough guy to finish. Yeah, Kelly is a, a very highly ranked national competitor, so he better he better be prepared for it. And if he somehow manages to get those wins, we're going to know who he is pretty quick. Absolutely. Co main event. Curtis Kluschinski. Yeah. 
versus Jeff Frank. I'm gonna. I've never heard of Jeff Frank. Well, I'm gonna go with Jeff Frank three <laughs> one. Because I know Curtis. The, I know what's Curtis. The I know Curtis, and he's wishy washy, and I don't know. That seems to do a lot more talking and yapping. Well, yeah. Jeff Frank just went down and had a super match with uh, Destroyer Chuck Young. Oh shit! And lost three nothing. No, Chuck has a good hand. Yeah. Jeff is the president of the Alberta Arm, Arm Wrestling Association, and he's uh, relatively new. But um, I think it's a good match. I think it'll be an entertaining match. Uh, Curtis has a longer arm. Jeff is a relatively uh, – he's not nearly as tall as Curtis is. So I think Curtis would be a top role, probably three to one. Yeah. So you got Curtis, really? Wow. I got Curtis. Sorry, Jeff. Yeah. I'll keep an eye on that one. I got Jeff all day. It will be it will be streamed, so check out Fit to Fight Arm Sports League. And then we've got our main event. You know who's pulling in the main event? Uh, it's you and Big Rich, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, Big Rich. Again, hard to predict when a guy's been out for a year or two minimum. Um, he's got a little bit of an advantage on you with brute force, but I think his hand's going to get cracked a little bit. I mean, if his hand comes in in, in top shape, you, you might be in trouble. You will be in trouble. This is right arm, I imagine, right? This is right arm, yeah. Um, if, if his hand is any is, is lacks a little, any bit of conditioning or um, he's sluggish or uh, you'll, you'll crack it. Um, and then once you crack it, it won't be easy. He's got to, even if he's untrained, his arm is titanic. So, I mean, uh, I have you... 3-1 long matches. I have me 3 nothing. Well, your prediction doesn't matter. You're too biased. <laughs> it's noted, but it's noted. But I'll I'll let you I'll uh, I'll let you know your prediction if you end up losing. Now, what would it take for me to like are we talking about just my prediction not coming through like if it's 3 to 1 or if it's 3 to no, 2 or am I only getting a hard time if I lose the match? No prediction. The amount when, when it's three one three two. It doesn't matter either you win or you lose it. Um, but uh, it, it'll be. I'm curious to see where Rick comes in. Uh, Rich comes in at what what level of conditioning and and focus and stuff like that. Um, but if he comes in in his 2010 version, you're in trouble. Um, he he might have more hand and definitely more arm. Um, he's got got to be 70 years old. No. No. 60. Not yet? 64, and I think it'll be his 64th birthday on the day of the event. Yeah, um, I haven't seen much of him, um, so hard to tell, but um, because we know your shape and your conditioning, um, I'll give you an edge. Um, but man, work on that hand. You'll need to work on that hand. Well, there's nothing to work on now. I'm in rest mode, so no, I mean, work on oh, his, on or his. yeah, yeah. I'm gonna like if somehow, like, uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna hook him first match. Yeah, we're going inside. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, maybe second match too. Mm -hmm. And if I drop two of those, maybe I start working on his fingers. Sounds good. I'll I'll, I'll try to catch that. I'm gonna take the Mike Gould uh, approach. So if the people don't know what I'm talking about. Go watch the match. It's on YouTube. Yeah. All right, Gobby, we got a good guest coming on, Mr. Paul Passmore. Um, just to give some people some context here, Paul just beat Matt Mask 3 nothing left-handed. And a couple of wall cards ago, he pulled Corey West, the gorilla, and I believe he beat him two matches to nothing if I'm not... No, no, it was 2-1. to one. Correct? Yeah. In a wall prelim match. So the prelim matches are best of three. Uh, and what has he done beyond that recently that we should talk about? He's well, been also, killing guys. Like, he had... Uh, he also tied her. I mean, he drew. He, he drew uh, with Herman, right? They got a three-three draw in that super match. Yeah, and why are people trying trying to do the six rounders over here? I don't. I've never understood that because it only could, it only makes sense if you're gambling because it offers a a higher risk uh, gamble. But they weren't gambling online, yeah. So it makes no sense. The three-three for me, I I got it with Zlati. I, I understood it was Zlati because of the 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 arm bets. But uh, in Mississippi, why why the hell would you want to have a draw as an option? Yeah. 
baffles me. Okay, buddy. Well, let's get Paul on here, and we'll be back. Uh, well, as far as you guys are concerned watching, we'll be back in one second. Sounds good. All right, guys. Welcome our special guest today, Tom Crossfire. Mr. Paul Passmore, how are you doing today, sir? Doing very well. How are y'all today? We're great. Good. I'm great. Yeah, sorry. I can't speak for Gobby here. He's... I'm good. I'm good. You're good. All right. Listen, Paul, we're uh, excited to have you on the show, particularly because you've been on a bit of a tear lately. So give us some insight on to what, like, maybe your last three super matches you've had and uh, how they went. Well, uh Got a good chance to pull Corey West at uh, Wall 505 on an undercard. And uh, he's an absolute, just, you know, the, the gorilla suits him well. He's extremely large, strong, fast, athletic uh, puller, training with a world champion. I was able to beat him back in December for the PAF finals during in the bracket. And, um, I, you know, I kind of messed around with him a little bit during the match and held him and told him to pull. And uh, anyway, we laughed about that a little bit, but it got a little personal before the uh, before the match. And then we we got out there and you know stood toe to toe like two men and banged it out and uh, shook hands and squashed the, the the little rivalry we had going. And we we get along pretty good now, but it was a great match. Um, he he had definitely improved a lot. I had also improved and. Um, so anyway, I think at, at one point, I, even though I had defeated him pretty convincingly earlier, I had become the underdog again. It seems like every match I pull, you know, just being a, a much smaller super heavyweight, I'm always the small dog in the fight. I uh, end up being the underdog. So uh, can I can I just ask you, like, what are how tall are you and what do you weigh? I weigh I'm six foot tall. I weigh about two sixty five. I pulled two forty two for years. And was pretty dominant in the 242 class. I went to the AAA Nationals and won uh, the national championship, both arms undefeated at 242. And that was when I realized that that weight class really doesn't get much recognition. It doesn't get much respect. Unfortunately, it's a good weight class, but it's usually the first one left out of a tournament. And I was kind of spinning my wheels. So I felt like I, in my mind I had the power to bang with the big boys. So I was going to go test that theory and so I, my walk around weight was 265 or so if I wasn't dieting and, and doing a lot of cardio so I just decided to come into PAF finals um, at my walk around weight and see what happened and ended up going undefeated both arms on that I took out uh, Sean Latimer which was my nice yeah he's he's a good win you know that uh, going down there that's who i was aiming to pull and really try to prove where i was at to myself and everybody else and it was a nasty match i met him in the brackets it was a brutal match and then i had to beat him uh two more times which was kind of rough but you know i beat him once and i was on the a side but we still had to go two more times in the final match and uh him being a, a very extremely large uh more experienced puller powerhouse too we we got into some nasty matches for that one and then uh i pulled carl stanley for left first handed you know left handed for uh first place and that was a pretty rough match as well he's a bull and so i felt really good about myself i felt like i kind of made that's where i first got my name on the map during that tournament and that's what i set out to do and then um you know like i said it evolved back around to Corey again and then um, I know I had a super match with Chris Chandler, who was also somebody I've always looked up to. He's a, you know, I, I, in my mind, he's, he's definitely one of the elite pullers. He's, he's been there forever. He's a powerhouse. And uh, he ended up defeating me in the super match. And it, been, it was a really good one. But then we had a, a rematch a couple weeks later. I made some adjustments, watched what I did in the match. I, uh, I, I didn't pull real smart that day. And um, he had some strength in some places that I guess that's why they call him the freak. He, he was able to pull out of some some uh, places that nobody normally can, and it, it really threw me off. So in my mind, when he beat me the first time, I was like, well, he can't do that again. So I did the same exact thing three times before, 
you know, he finally beat it in my head that he could. And so I made some adjustments and pulled him smarter later, was able to beat him. But uh, that's what makes a good rivalry. You know, they beat you, you beat them, y'all are pushing each other. We live fairly close now. So he's going to be another good rival, I'm sure, for years to come. And then, uh, you know, I had the, the big, huge upset here recently over Matt Mask. You know, he's definitely a, a elite puller that uh, I was honored honestly to get a match with and then also herman stevens who was also a big honor to get a match with and it was uh i knew it would be a learning experience with uh herman and his table iq and uh also pulling matt the same day so me and herman agreed to six rounds kind of the zloty european style which is how he likes to pull and uh, a lot of people were, were saying that's that's not a good idea and um in my mind, it just it sounded fun, and I believe it would push me outside of my comfort zone. And I would definitely, after going six rounds with somebody like him, it would uh, I would learn and improve. And if there was anything I needed to work on, it would definitely be something that I uh, needed to work on. And um, so we ended up going. I beat him the first two. He beat me the second two. I beat him the the fifth, and then so. If you look at it, I beat him the two out of three, and then I beat him three out of five, and then he come back and beat me the six. So we ended up <coughs> tooth and nail. I mean, we hit each other with a kitchen sink. Neither one of us had anything left when it was over. It was brutal. It was just, it was awesome. You know, it's, I, it's why you want to arm wrestle is getting a fight like that, you know, where you got to really reach down deep and go. And uh, then 10 minutes later, I had to pull Matt Mask. So. <laughs> You know, I was still. Uh, oh, that makes it even more impressive. I didn't realize you had to pull Herman before you pulled Matt. Yes, yes. So I was wondering when that match with Herman was over, I was like, how in the hell am I facing to go pull Matt now? But I caught my breath. You know, I got off my feet and rested a few minutes and uh, went back up there and shocked the world, um, beating Matt 3 0. I had a really good, solid game plan for him. I felt like I would be the, the more physically strong puller. Uh, I knew I had to just stop his hit. I felt like uh, Todd Hutchings, uh, I modeled my style after him a lot. Um, he kind of laid out a really good blueprint on how to beat Matt. And uh, I, I kind of followed that. Uh, and it, it turned out to be a pretty good one for someone with a similar leverage to Hutchings, uh, pulls a similar style. And uh, it, it worked pretty well for me. It was an impressive win. And, um, yeah, that was – even hearing with Herman, that's even better. Raymond Cote wants us to uh, – is this your Rebel Dog 10? That's your Country Crush uh, code? Yeah, if you want to buy anything from uh, Country Crush or the website, use that and you get 10% off. Nice. nice. Yeah. yeah. So what do you got coming up, Paul? Like now that you've done – like you've amassed some wins over some impressive guys, that's a very good resume so far. What's well, next? Next, um, I was trying to work out a really big match. It didn't quite pan out. Uh, <laughs> just anyway, I got uh, the next big thing will probably be PAF finals just because they're doing it again in Atlanta. So it's about a you know 45 minute drive. I'm not having to get on a plane or go six hours somewhere. And that'll be mid November. That'll be a fun tournament. And then uh, I've got Florida State. I got a super match with Dicky Spearoff, left handed. And uh, he's, he's just an animal. And, That's uh, another good match. Uh, that will be a really good one. He's he's as good as they get. Um, we pulled in overalls uh, at PAF finals last year. It was the only loss I took. You know, I, I attribute it to being pretty gassed out. Um, you know, he, he blew through his class and didn't really have anybody slow him down all day. And I attribute it to being gassed out. So I'm going to go test that theory. I'm going into it expecting a. Similar war as, as I had with Herman, you know, just we're going to have to go in there and reach down deep and uh, see who comes out at the end. It's going to be one of those uh, tooth and nail battles, I'm sure. And then I also that same day I'll have uh, Chance Shaw. And, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, he, he wanted it, so he's going to get it. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> he called down the thunder on that one. So. Man, Chance is good. But, he's I mean, good. He's yeah. good. He took out Zena. I'm not taking him lightly. It'll be fun. Man, you got you got a tough series of matches coming up. And are you just getting offered these things, or are you calling people out? 
I'm I'm getting called out every day. It's it's kind of crazy, you know. My my dream's been uh, been working towards trying to get on and uh, get some of the, get in with the Super Series with Wall. Um, yeah. There's you know a lot of speculation. Uh, nothing nothing solid. I know kind of the behind the scenes thing with me and Corey. Everybody was saying more than likely the winner between you and Corey will get a contract, but you know in, until it happens, nothing's nothing's in in concrete. So I just got my fingers crossed on that one. I'm just doing my part. Hopefully that'll happen. Well, who do you want of the WAL roster? Who do you want? Uh, my first pick would be Krasimir. He just likes to hook. Really? Uh, yeah, I just I love a good hook match. Todd Hutchings would be my second pick. Uh, Aiello would be a fun one. Um, I'm not afraid to pull. I mean, everybody tries to top roll me. I just enjoy someone who is not afraid to dive into a hook with me, you know, at least once. Um, just a more uh, enjoyable match for me instead of just this typical stop their pronation or, uh, you know, stop their supination and try to cup them and pull them in. And if you're able to do that, it's a pretty easy match. If you're not, it's, it's ugly. Then I got to transition to my slip and press and the straps and all that nasty nice yeah i'm with you on that one it's also it's really awesome when you don't have to feel you have to protect your hand and it can go right into your power and see who has more um i'm with you there it's super enjoyable when that happens yeah you know if you get to pick your 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 opponent you would want somebody that that you haven't pulled that's kind of on your level that likes to hook and you've always kind of wondered if you could beat them you know those would be the guys that i want uh Todd Hutchins would definitely be up there, honestly, because I modeled what I do after him. You know, mm-hmm. I've watched him and and Dicky Spiroff. Really, I kind of made a hybrid of of their just power hook style and and made my own out of it. And you know, want to want to pull the guys that I modeled myself after and see how I stack up. Cody Merrick in the comments says, "How is it that Gobby is the best looking person on my monitor right now?" <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Well, that's not, that's not saying too much there. No, it's not. <laughs> I think it's just because he's into little guys. Well, maybe so. <laughs> we're, 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 uh, we're arm wrestlers, not uh, not, not fashion models. <laughs> I wanted to ask you something. Um, how how big was it for you to watch your wife win her super match at Mississippi State? Oh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Oh, man, it was awesome. Candy is a, a very good female puller. She trains yeah. with us all the time. Ron Bath is kind of the captain of our team and we have practice at my house every two weeks as long as you know all of our schedules work with it and um you know it's kind of funny a lot of people say i'm candy's coach but i couldn't be anything further than candy's coach a lot of the really good top rollers that train with us she'll listen to them and pull but my style is completely different than hers you know i can corner her i know the you know, I know how to top roll, and I've actually got a very highly underrated one. And I'll, I'll break it out usually at least once in a tournament and surprise somebody or something. But, uh, yeah, she uh, she got in there. Uh, that was a good match for her to kind of get her name out there against Blanca Vega. Blanca has a, you know, she's pretty well recognized. She's competed a lot of different places. And um, so we were both – it was a good build up to that. Um, and Candy – you know, standing right there and watching it up front, Candy dominated, and uh, just she executed the perfectly good, uh, good game plan. Got a really good fair uh, rest grip, and just did her thing, imposed her will. Yeah, I, I was pretty impressed with um, how composed she was because it seemed like Blanca um, was was pretty um, not hostile but very aggressive, and I was impressed on how how uh, composed Candy was and kept focus and. Just dominant performance for sure. Yeah. yeah, Candy's got ice in her veins. Uh, she yeah. takes a lot to get her rattled. She she does well. I guess I don't know. I had a I had a background in MMA, and a lot of the times, you know, when I'd be out there in front of a few thousand people fighting, um, she'd come out there in the cage afterwards and stand with me when I'm talking and stuff. So nice. she's pretty comfortable in front of people, um, yeah. and she's a fierce competitor. Uh, there's really no fear in her. Um, you know, she's coming up and she's training hard. And that was a good match for her on the level she's at. And uh, she was able to win convincingly. And, um, you know, it's kind of kind of what I've done just over the years, pick out my next opponent and try to keep creeping my way up. You know, I don't want to try to grab, you know, some plank off right now, but uh, maybe sometime in the future. You know, I want to 
just keep seeing where I'm at and testing and setting my sights on the next guy and seeing how it goes. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah, it's been fun. You know, arm wrestling is something I, I just uh, I strongly enjoy. It's, it's a lot of fun. When I got out of – I've always been in some kind of sport. When I got out of MMA in my early 30s, I just recently turned 40. Um, but I felt lost all of a sudden. I just didn't have something to compete in. And my cousin's husband, Tim McPherson, who's another really good arm wrestler, he, he had been arm wrestling already for years and uh, had established himself pretty well. Um, he kind of in, invited me to start trying that, and so I fell in love with it pretty quick. And, you know, we've been training together ever since. He's he's definitely taught me a lot. Nice. Yeah. So for those of you, everyone that's tuning in, maybe you could get you to talk a little bit about your background, like um, however far back you want to go and how you eventually found arm wrestling. Yeah, I got a funny story. Um, I was, you know, you know, everybody before they start actually competing in arm wrestling was undefeated, you know, until they start really pulling other arm wrestlers. It's just about everybody was the barroom champ or their high school champ or whatever. So that was me. You know, I, I had beaten everybody <laughs> uh, I'd ever pulled. My uncle was a, uh, my uncle Bob marriage was Terry Beamett. He was a pro arm wrestler back in the day and he had showed me a lot of things to do that your average guy you pulled in school or at the bar just had no idea. I, I was aware of a top roll and, you know, you know, capping with my grip and certain different moves. And if you just know that basic knowledge, you'll beat most people. So when I was 20, I went to Las Vegas on a trip, just like a vacation. It was a GNC sports expo. At the time I was probably, I was, into like bodybuilding and I was all ripped up. So I was probably about 190 pounds and Cobra Rhodes was doing a expo. Just anybody want to go up there and arm wrestling could arm wrestling. So I went up there and he was just slamming all these pro bodybuilders, all these 300 pounds, just jack dudes, just running right through them. And I got up there and, uh, we, we had two really hard pulls and both of them resulted in a slip. And then they wanted to put the straps on. And he said, you know, just for some amateur coming out of the crowd, I'm, it's not, you know, not really worth going into the straps. He said, man, if you don't arm wrestle, you're really missing out on the call and you got a lot of natural ability. So I remembered that. And uh, I got my first, <laughs> about 2008, I got my first real tournament. It was kind of an amateur tournament in my hometown. And I destroyed everybody. So I was getting a little bit cocky. And I said, you know, who wants some? And they said, well, there's a guy we can call. Um, uh, we can get him here. And if you beat him, you've really done something. I said, well, get his big butt up here. Who is it? And they said, his name's Dave Randall. Oh. I didn't yeah. have any clue who Dave Randall was. So at this point, I've never lost. So in my mind, you know, okay, get him up here. I've beaten real big dudes. So Dave Randall – I waited on him about an hour, just so happy. This is when Dave Randall was, you know, world champ. This was 2006 to 2008, somewhere. Dave Randall, he he, he pulls up in a extended cab F250 and gets out, and it, he looked like it, the truck looked too small for him. I was like, my God! And just across the parking lot, they're like, there he is. And so I was like, all right, well, I can still beat him. You know, <laughs> he's walking across the parking lot, and as he's approaching. I'm like, my God, this dude's a mountain. You know, we had to turn sideways to walk in the door. He goes, where's this guy at? I said, I'm right here. I shook his hand, and it felt like I grabbed a bunch of bananas. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, well, you want to get on the table? I said, well, yeah. So we got on the table, and I just hit him with everything I had. And I was strained. I looked up, and he's just kind of looking around the room, talking to somebody. I said, oh, my God. And he slammed me. So that was the first time my arm had ever been put down in my life. And I had no idea the caliber of just animal that I was, I had grabbed a hold of. So I said, you can't do that again. So he, he did it again, both arms, probably 30 times. And, uh, at the time I was a career firefighter and paramedic and, uh, <laughs> I went to work the next day and I literally could not like pick up the stretcher. And I said, man, the hell with arm wrestling, I'm going to stay fighting, you know, <laughs> and it just turns out that, that, uh, tournament was Tim McPherson's first tournament. Cause I called him did family get togethers. We would always arm wrestle. So 
I got Tim there, and uh, he stayed with it from that day on. And I went back to fight, and I was like, you know, if somebody can do me like that, then I don't want to compete in this sport. I, I suck. But a few years later, I was watching some stuff. It was kind of the game of arms type, and it kind of got me researching arm wrestling a little bit and learning about it. And I was looking for something to do. And at that point is when I truly realized who Dave Randall was. You know, I was like, well, I guess it wasn't that bad to get beat up by him. But he literally ripped my arms off and <laughs> and beat me with them. So it was crazy. Hell of a first loss. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Um, Georgia has a rich history of arm wrestlers with Bath, um, Randall, and um, uh, what's the big dude's name? Um, Johnny Walker. No, no. Well, Johnny Walker. There's a. There's another one. That can't come to mind. The six hundred. Creve Dean. Yeah, the six hundred pounds. All I mean, those guys. I come from a good lineage of of pullers. You know, they've all kind of passed down their knowledge. You know? Yeah. Um, we all still kind of train the same way. They've always trained. It's a good team to be part of, and. I noticed a lot of different teams and states have drama and different teams and kind of don't get along, but pretty much everybody in Georgia is one big family. We all get along great and train together and travel a few hours and, you know, do a lot to try to help each other too. Um, we're not afraid to say, hey, man, you definitely need to start working on this, you know, or that, or and, uh, we criticize each other and we take the criticize, criticism well and we do our best to stay out of each other's way. You know, if, if we can in these tournaments too, you know, try to figure out what weight classes to compete in is and it's best where we don't end up tripping each other up in a tournament or something. But you know, inevitably we run into each other's song. Fair enough, man. Yeah, I know. All these years of pulling Ron Bath, you know, that's a a good caliber to see. You know, as when I first pulled him it was like grabbing a freight train, you know, I just couldn't do anything with him. And over the years I got to where I could slow him down some and got to where I could bang with him. And, you know, now in practice, we're just going at it. And, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of surreal to think, and it gives me a lot of confidence when you look across the table and you're going toe to toe with Ron back and forth in practice that, you know, wow, I've, I've come a long way. And, um, uh, it gives you confidence going into match with anybody, knowing that you can, you know, go in there and, and bang with Ron that whoever you're pulling, you know, yeah, I can beat them too. Yeah, I'm good to pull them too. It gives you confidence, you know. <laughs> That's where a lot of it comes from in this sport. You gotta believe in yourself. If you don't really honestly think you can win, you definitely won't. Have you ever thought about uh going overseas or going to um WAF or IFA or anything like that? Absolutely. That'd be a dream come true. Um, it's just kind of all in the funding. You know, I got two young children right now and uh, all this and that, but it would definitely be something. And uh, given a good opportunity, I would jump all over. It'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, and at the end of the day, I do the sport because I enjoy it. I think that's, you know, reason it's not something you'll ever, I think, get rich doing or even make a lot of money. It's just, it's just very enjoyable. I, I like the camaraderie and the, and the friendships I've made too. With, I met a lot of really cool people. Now I got to ask you: You pulled Matt left. Wayne Withers pulled him right arm. Uh, have, you, have you and Wayne pulled recently? Yes, we have. We pulled at Alabama State. We met in the brackets. Uh, I've gotten a few wins on Wayne over the years. He's probably beaten me more than I've beaten him. Uh, we haven't ever really went fresh on fresh though. It was a it was a brutal tournament at Alabama State. I just had to pull. I, I pulled Nate Adams, and that was he's a he's a he's a monster, and uh, he's kind of a big strong hook puller. He's definitely on par with like me and Chris Chandler, and I beat him, and it was in a hook. Mm -hmm. And then I pulled BJ Fakakis, and he's got this nasty hit, but I was able to beat him in in, in a row. And then I had Wayne right after that, and so it. it, it Really bad timing for Wayne. I'd like to have you know made him maybe first in the tournament or something. I've pulled Nate Adams. I pulled him at uh, WAL a couple of years ago. How'd that go? Was did you get him? I beat him, but he we did end up in a hook. He's a very big, strong boy. Ain't he? he is a strong guy. Yeah. 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 I'm reliving all those memories from WAL 2015 because they just started showing them in Canada. Yeah. 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 All right, Gobby, what you got? Paul, um, are you more of a table or gym guy? Oh, that's interesting. 
I'll, I'll tell you my kind of my training strategy. So we have a practice every two weeks, every Saturday, every two weeks in my house. And we just, we go for two or three, sometimes four hours. I have 20, 30 people show up now. Um, and then the Saturdays we don't have practice. I have a, a really, I've, I've got every handle out there and, um, you know, different uh training type tables and bands and stuff and i'll put on two or three hours just by myself of really really hard intense training on the saturdays that i don't have my table practices and i make sure the table practices are, are brutal and I'm, i've just i've worked really hard and steady for the, the entire time everybody's there and if i didn't get a hard enough workout i'll do some some gym stuff afterwards but i would say i'm probably 50 50 i, I make sure i'm on the table regular and hard with the biggest, strongest guys we can find a lot of times. You know, we're, we're trying to get somebody like Nate Adams to come train with us or Chris Chandler. Ron's there every time just about. And, uh, so it's usually a brutal practice if even one of them shows up. If all of them do, do then we're all going to be pretty sore when it's over and get a good workout on the table and try a lot of different angles, get in bad spots, work out of it. Um, but, yeah, I do a lot. M most of my training – when there, nobody's there, I got one of those power pull tables and the cable pulley, and I do a lot of you know, the the Raptor handle with a good two inch grip on it, a lot of pull on it from different angles. Work that drop yeah. stuff. Cool. So we have always got questions coming in, and uh, you want to take part with us in trying to answer some of these things because they usually generate some pretty interesting discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, Give people some good insight onto other things that we might not otherwise see. Gobby, are you ready for that? Always. Now, this is an interesting one because it was a follow-up question. But what would happen? Remember the question about if a great lightweight would arm wrestler uh, would arm wrestle a man of great strength? Remember that question? Yep. Yes. So the question is: There's an arm wrestling match in one hour between four-time world strongest man Brian Shaw and Gabriela Vasconcelos. You are hired as Brian's arm wrestling coach, but only have one hour to get him ready. Who wins that match? Brian. 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 It's, that's <laughs> too, much, too much to overcome. Plus, too much end. Too Gabby's, much end. Kind of a, Gabby's kind of a power puller, too, though. You know, she, she's just going to clamp down and overpower you. There's not a whole lot of finesse. She just brutes through everybody that she grabs. Yeah, I guess I would I would tend to agree with you guys, Brian. Like, I mean, Gabrielle is going to beat most men her size if they are not arm wrestlers. And uh, but Brian Shaw is man is four hundred pounds. Yeah. It's not it's not even his weight that I worry about. It's the fact that he's got such a mammoth hand that I would just have him coach to to grip a little bit lower, bridge right across her wrist, which would shut down all her back pressure and pronation. Because I, I imagine. His hand is colossally strong, too, not just big. So right then and there, she might get an inch off the hit, but, I mean, she'll be he'll she'll, he'll absorb everything else. Um, so it really comes down to the size and strength of his hand, really, that she would not be able to exploit. Brian Shaw has the world record in the Denny Stones. Well, there you go, right. And uh, so his hand is colossally strong. You know, I'm not sure big old Paul there would – would uh he, he he might have his work cut out both of you might have your work cut out with, with quite him. possibly yeah, that, that's arms going up to pull him i know that with brian shaw yeah, yeah. you don't think so uh, well you know what if that man trained for a year in arm wrestling he might be the guy <laughs> like he, right. but, exactly. he yeah. yeah i'd be nervous i honestly think i would beat him but i'd be i'd have a lot of a lot of butterflies going into that one just it's kind of the unknown because you know his hand's gonna be really strong. Yeah, I mean, um, body, bodybuilders are one thing because usually they neglect their hand and their wrists always flop back. So even though they have these massive biceps and shoulders and chest, you can get around it. But a, a power lifter, you know, right off the, the bat, has a, an incredibly strong forearm, hand, and wrist. Um, well, so it's kind of different when you when you're talking about a power lifting coming straight in, a power lifter coming uh, straight into a, an arm wrestling match. Usually has more to deal with more more uh, tools than uh, than any other you know sport coming into to our sport well, yeah. he's physically so large that you would almost have to well you'd run out of pad if you're trying to top roll him yeah 
didn't Larry Wills pull pull around with him or something at one point? I thought I saw. I'm not sure. I know. It seems like I saw something. Yeah, like I've seen Larry Wills do a lot of stuff with arm wrestling lately, and uh, he's getting beat a lot. So I don't know if he's doing anything with Brian Shaw. I, I, I seem to recall something like that. Yeah, I, I think I recall uh, Biazikov beating Larry Wills too, and he's probably yeah. 165 pounds. Yeah, he, he's got an amazing amount of technique, though. So, yeah. uh, Brandon Justice says, "Name a pro she would crush." So we're talking Gabriella, Adam Wilmot. There you go. <laughs> Poor Adam Wilmot, man. Well, I, I can name a whole bunch. <laughs> I can name a whole bunch. How about, um, well, pros? Um, I would say most average pro men, not elites, just mm-hmm. your average pro third place guy. Like you would like, Chris would probably put a tier three type pro. Uh, her weight, I would say, Gabby would beat. I've I've talked to a few men that's you know I, I know Gabby. I've met her several times, and I've talked to a few men that's kind of played around after pull. And everybody, I haven't ever pulled with her myself, but everybody that's pulled with her says she feels like a very strong heavyweight man. Jesus. But, yeah, that's interesting. So yeah. maybe, maybe the gap is much bigger than we thought as far as between her and the next the second place woman in her class yes i believe i believe there's a huge gap um yeah. from, from what i've from what i've been told um she's if you're gonna get on the table and play around be ready to be embarrassed if you're not on your a game so the next question we have is from uh bard grindheim and we've uh, we had a similar question to this before gobby but I'll ask this one again. What do you guys think about bringing tournaments back next WAL season? Uh, some of the show or the first show then super match format to end the season. For example, a pure lightweight tournament with all the contenders from the past seasons, then a middleweight tournament, tournament, and then a heavyweight for the third one. By doing that, there'd be a clear champion every show. Since this would be a small tournament with contenders the fans already know, I don't think it would be less entertainment for pay-per-view each tournament. And show could have about eight to ten contenders. Thoughts? Take this one, Paul. That's all about money and entertainment. You know, at the end of the day, that's what Wall is. It's so uh, they're 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 there to make money, and they're there to put on an entertaining show. So maybe do a super series, and then also uh, do you know tournaments, kind of like they did back in 2016, and televise it and mix it up some you know that way it wouldn't be all the same format every time you'd have a good tournament to watch maybe throw in two or three big tournaments and then uh four or five big super series and expand the brand a little bit and people would probably tune in for the tournaments and it would give a little bit of a of a a more of a diverse type presentation more different you know things to see interesting i always compare WAL to fighting, which I'm sure you can appreciate, like the UFC style and how they got away from the tournament style uh, of show at one point because, uh, you know, everything can go wrong in a tournament and you often have alternates coming in or guys injured and get pulled out. Uh, But I think that the, the model they're following right now is probably the perfect one for entertainment. So tournaments for maybe amateur or novice pullers that WAL is putting on with the Buffalo Wild Wings series. But I think that the, if they look around, they can put together some pretty solid cards that people are going to follow. Because since these super match cards in the Super Series have started, I've never missed one. I haven't either. They've all been pretty entertaining. Yeah. Here's something for you guys. Ron Bass says, and she's, he's talking about Gabby, I let her get me over to play and couldn't move her when she was in her sweet spot hook. That's impressive. Ron had told me that. I wasn't going to say Ron's name, but that's that was one of the people that pulled her out with her, and he's told me that. So, I mean, if he says that, I could not imagine the power. My wife pulled her. Um, she said it was it was like an immovable object. She said she felt, you know, just as overwhelmed as if she was pulling with me or something. And then Michael chimed in on the last question and said, and Michael Todd, that is, the public did not buy into the tournament shows. They would have continued if the public had supported it. So interesting. I, uh, yeah, good insight there. Uh, yeah. As arm wrestlers, as arm wrestlers uh, spectating or participating, we love the fact that it, an event, a tournament format 
Um, but I think um, for their profit and their best interest, uh, talking about the Wall League, I think uh, the, the, the super match format is better for them. But I, I still think at one point they'll throw in a tournament here and there. Um, it's just, just to keep uh, the arm wrestling demographic, um, you know, interested and motivated. Um, well, with that said, they do the the local series. Like I competed right. at Wall Kansas, and it was tele. It was a big tournament, and the whole thing was televised on um, BR Live. Uh, Ron was up there with me, and he had a super match, and I had a super match. I had two super matches, and they televised it on BR Live. And Ron and Brian Kerner also commentated the whole thing, and it was a pretty good show. So yeah, they do. Um, they do kind of have that already. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, that wasn't even pay per view. You could just tune in on Beer Live and watch it. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Justice says, "Does anyone else feel underwhelmed with Wagner?" This guy. This guy. I, I want Wagner. I, I think I could beat him. Honestly. Yeah, you, you both could beat him. Yeah, um, I, I think SB would be more ready for Devin. Honestly, I'd like to see that. I, but I want Wagner. I feel like Wagner's kind of a closer next stepping stone for me. Um, um, I think it'd be an interesting match. I'd love to do it. I'm not positive I could beat him, but I do want him in uh, left. But I think uh, Espy's ready to take on some I like Devin, you know, because comparing matches, Cody Spur beat me left. It was a great match, you know, but he, he took me out. Um, and then you beat Cody. So, and, and being in Canada, you, you've never you've never pulled Devin left? I think I, I don't recall. I think uh... – some I think I pulled them like in two thousand and one. Okay. <laughs> Which is yeah, I don't know. They uh I if I had if somebody came up to me and said at six oh one or came if Well came to me and said at six oh one, you're pulling Devin and I've got all that time to prepare for it, I'm winning that match. Not gonna happen. I, I would love to see it. I would love to see it. Uh, man, I, that, that, I think it'd sell tickets. You know, it'd sell more pay per views if that's what they're if they're after money. That's a money match in my mind. I would tune in. Yeah, I'd love to see that too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we got another question, and I think uh, I think this one is. Hmm. It says, "Hey guys, love the show." Quick question: If you broke your dominant arm wrestling arm today and had to have surgery, and they had to put a plate in. But the doctor says that four months after surgery, you would have free reign to start lifting slowly and training again. And at one year, you can compete again. What would the next eight months look like for you guys, barring no to minimal setbacks as far as training regimen? Thanks, guys. Keep up the good work. So upon the four-month mark, after you have the green light to start lifting weights, what would the eight months between that and your competition look like? It's another one of these subjective questions that we could have completely different answers for. Um, well, it'd be just uh, training, training and getting my confidence back up in that arm. It would be for the first, probably the first month would probably be t uh, gym, getting uh, tissue back, uh, getting confidence in the, in the structural aspects. And then I'd probably throw in a practice to see how I feel. And once I, once I practice, I feel that I can control the people that I used to control. Then it's rock and roll time. Just once your confidence is up on the table uh, and, you've, and uh, you know, Simple as that, I believe. Mentally overcoming it would probably be pretty rough. It's probably the hardest part, mentally. Um, yeah. I, I was part of one broken arm match, and <clears throat> it wasn't my arm that broke. And uh, honestly, that's the, having that happen and just being that locked in and seeing and feeling that gentleman's arm snap messed me up. It threw me off pretty bad for a year. It seemed like every time I went up to the table – it make you know you always you see it happen and it's one thing, um, but when you really you're locked in there and you feel it happen, it's another thing. It makes it a lot more real, and um, you know I, it was hard to get that out of my head. And you can't be thinking that when you're going into a match. You know if you got any type of hesitation or anything, it's, you're not going to perform very well. You got to be 100 percent focused on what you're doing. We all take that risk. It could happen. Um, but yeah, like overcoming it mentally would probably be the hardest part. It'd just be just training as usual once my body healed up, though, um, physically. I can kind of speak to this because it, it happened to me in a way because I broke my left hand uh, in 2007. I had a spiral fracture right here. 
and that bone is being held together by a couple of screws. So I had to take several months off of training and coming back, but it wasn't much, it wasn't an arm break from an arm wrestling match. So there wasn't the mental thing to overcome. It was a matter of getting range of motion back in that hand and, uh, and then starting to train slowly and get it stronger and be very aware of uh, foreign aches and pains as you're doing that. So if, if, I, didn't have, of, if I didn't have, yeah, if I didn't have knowledge of history, I would probably never arm wrestle again with that arm. But the history tells us that once your arm's been broken and healed, uh, it comes back uh, denser, stronger, and more resilient. Um, and usually people perform better with it after time. So knowing that, um, I think that would motivate me to try to get back quicker and stronger and all that stuff. But but Paul's right. The mental aspect would definitely be something you'd have to overcome. Adam Wilmot has a question for you in the comments, and he wants it answered, Gobby. Says if he thinks my if Gobby thinks my match with Hale was fake, who on the roster would he like to see me pull? I don't think there's anyone on the roster, the current roster that you can beat. Oh man! Well, look, look at look at his weight class. Look at his weight class, right? Who 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 on that on their on their active roster for for matchups for super match cards? I mean, who wouldn't Adam be like the lowest lowest on that totem pole? Um, I don't know. Um, well, I, think it, I mean, they could bring in anyone they want in the past roster. It's just a matter of them keeping the pool in that class very small. So uh, you have Sam Harris, who took a loss to, as the champion, took a loss, who just beat Jeff Hale, who just beat Adam Wilmont. Who else is there that's active right now at this moment? Well, that's it. I mean, uh, Yanis, Tony, Sam... Uh, anyone we've seen in in, the, in recent history, um, I think, uh, is is a a full tier above him. Why not Jamie Sheldon versus Adam Wilmot? Uh, J Jamie can match his hand and has more arm. That's a bad matchup for Adam. Um, Adam's hand heavy. Hand heavy only works when your hand is heavier than your opponent's. Um, Jamie has a great hand too, but Jamie has more more arm. That's a bad matchup for Adam. Adam. Um, just like Jeff Hale was a bad matchup for Adam. Yanis, Luke, he has wins on Yanis and Luke, but those were circumstantial. Um, what about Alan Fisher? Maybe too much hand. And as much, if not more, arm. Um, so the message for Adam so much is that he's going to shock the world no matter who it is. I love Adam, but I'm just speaking honestly that I, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I saw, I, I believe that match was staged. And, um, that's it. That's all. And I don't think, uh, I think Adam's a, a high end tier three. Um, I don't believe he's a tier four. Well, what do you think? If, if I was to pick, I'd go with uh, maybe Luke, um, possibly. I don't know. I mean, uh, is, is Max Taubin still pulling or is he just commentating? There you go. There yeah. you go. That would be huge. They're both threes, both, both tier threes. Both lively, both have personalities. That would be a that that that's that's a great answer. Yeah, yeah Max Tobin, Adam Lamont. Nobody to sleep on. Uh, I think no. it'd be a fun, fun match, fun match to watch. You know, yeah. give them both an, another opportunity to prove themselves if they're still on the roster. Yeah, yeah. You good know, one, Paul. Absolutely. Let them go from there. Yeah. That's a good pick, Adam. For the record, I don't think it was staged. Donna Purdy says any puller can do anything on any given day. I don't agree with that. Not everyone can do anything on any given day. In my mind, it wasn't staged. I was standing five foot behind them at Wall Tulsa when that match happened. It did definitely. If if, if it was staged, just seeing it in person, it, they did the best job acting I'd ever not, seen. Not not officially staged, but someone told Jeff, um, on, uh, you know, uh, maybe on a voice call, maybe, I don't know what, maybe via text, said, um, "Make it, you know, do your do your best, perform your best, but." Do not if you think you can go walk through him three nothing. Do not walk through him three nothing. Kind of make it look like he's got a chance, and he did so. I, I I'm, and it's not that I believe this theoretically. It's just that I, looking at the optics of the match, um, you know, in one in his first win, he as soon as he got his hook, he blew through him, and then all of a sudden, a match later, and Jeff has conditioning. Uh, all of a sudden, he's he's hooked up, and he can't finish him off with his with a full hook side pressure. Come on, man, and he's he's paused and he's he's hesitant. Come on. Just doesn't make sense to me. Hmm. I have no insight. I'm just going on base, basic observations. Okay, this one's an interesting one. Uh, if you had, if you had a one-time budget of one million dollars, you could throw one tournament. How would it look? 
What would be the weight classes? Would there be super matches, a tournament, round robin, titles? What would be the payouts, awards for the winners? Philip Philip Galvin. Um, for me, if I had a million dollars, I want to find out who the baddest motherfucker is. So I'm not saying it would be one open class, but I think it'd be something like maybe a I'd have two weight classes, maybe three if I'm really generous, but definitely no more than three. I don't think any arm wrestling tournament in, in, in any country, in any town, in any continent should ever have more than three weight classes. If you need to have more than three weight classes, you're catering to crybabies. Um, and I'm a small guy. I'd have to wait. I'd have to gain weight to, to, to make a, uh, an, an 87 or a 176 class, but that's fine. So I, I think I'd have. I don't, I, I'm big on having just one big fucking open weight class. Bracket by weight if, if you have some crybabies and you need to bracket everyone by their weight in the initial bracket. I'm fine with that. But I, I'd want to see who the fucking baddest motherfucker was and I'd have like a quintuple elimination like I did in 2009. you got to lose five times with one arm. Rock and roll. Let's see who's got the most. That was I think, fun. Yeah. I think it'd be something like that. Yeah. That'd be a lot of fun. Get Get some of the Europeans over. You know, every, a lot, a lot of people would would love to see some of them pull some of our top guys. You know, and just just get them out there and let them all go. Thousand guys, ten tables, a thousand, two thousand pullers, ten, fifteen, twenty table, you could whatever, and uh, cash the top fifty. Like, and with a million dollars, you can that cash is that's good cash, right? You can pay down the top, or even fi- the last place gets fucking, you know, fucking five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars. Yeah. Interesting. Be yes. effort to, to go pull something like that. That'd be amazing. I, I wish there was that kind of money in the sport. Well, they were getting close to that. Well, they weren't getting close to a million, but, I mean, WAL for a couple of seasons had some pretty good money. They sure did. <laughs> I couldn't imagine having $50,000 laying on the table, pulling for it right there in front of you. Wow. <laughs> That'd be something, wouldn't it? Uh, Travis had a $100,000 attorney last year. Did he? Yeah, uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona. Was it two years ago? <laughs> was it fifty grand or a hundred grand or I think it was fifty grand? Didn't he, didn't he pull the plug and grab the cash or something like that? I forget what. But I don't remember. He, he pulled in it and wanted himself or something. <laughs> yeah. Leslie Yoakum, uh, I was wondering. Well, this is this isn't a question for us. This is a question for Herman. But I guess they want our opinion. Uh, I was wondering why Herman Stevens doesn't pull in the WAL, Gobby. You can probably answer that. I feel based on what I've seen of him that if he got serious, was in shape, he could take the hammer from RVJ. What are your thoughts on this? I think at one point they lied to him or they tried to bullshit him or tried to um, undermine his, his intelligence. And he, on principle, told him to fuck off. And he's been holding that that stance. And, of course... For him, that league, every time he believed, he, he believed that the the, the, um, the Jeff Hale, um, um, Adam Wilmot match was staged. He, he sees he sees staging. He sees stuff like this, and it just he doesn't have much credibility or respect for that league. I believe, and that alone, you can't buy Herman with money. Herman doesn't give a fuck about money. Um, you're not gonna ease him on in or motivate him by money. He's gonna be motivated by. His own agenda, which is why he goes to Zlotti. He believes Zlotti is where he needs to test his metal. That's so. That's where he goes. It's not the best financial um, vehicle for him, but that's what he chooses because that's what his goal is. Uh, he's a, he's a rare man that way. Principle over pure profit. Yeah. Interesting. Then the second part. Well, I mean, the second part of the question is for all of us. If he was in shape and dedicated himself, could he take the hammer from RVJ? Easy. 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 Wow. Could he make the weight, though? Yes, of course. Yeah. He was, uh, like I said, I'm about 265. He's 220-ish somewhere. I think he competed in the 220 class. And, I mean, so that gave me a 40-pound, 45-pound weight advantage. And, you know, we went six brutal rounds. Um, He's... I, I think I don't think you'd have a whole lot of trouble yeah. taking that hammer at that weight. I actually had an interesting conversation with Herman after his match with Paul, um, and uh, I asked him um, how would he compare his his version that pulled Paul to the version that beat uh, or well, beat um, Todd Hutchins years ago when they had the uh, right and left arm super match, and he believed he was stronger going in versus Paul, which says a lot for Paul. Um, Herman's a super. 
hyper focused dude, super disciplined. He can make the weight. He can, you know, it's just a question of if he's internally motivated to do so. If it's in his best interest, then, uh, but yeah, he can definitely, definitely beat RVJ. Definitely beat RVJ. I agree completely. That's interesting. See, I don't have an insight on that because I have a very small. I mean, I gotta take I gotta take Paul's word for it because he's got the most recent pull with him. So, I mean, that's that's crazy. I think that uh, I think that they need to, or maybe RVJ needs to work on getting that match somewhere. If you really want to test yourself, you know, a lot of people would have been afraid to take a match like that with somebody with his caliber. But if you really want to test yourself. Get in there and go six rounds with him. If you can get the opportunity to, to do it, you'll definitely see where you're at. I, I, I was pleased with my results, you know, going, you know, because I knew it, it, anybody that really knows arm wrestling knew I was a massive underdog. So going in there and, and, and tying him, you know, in a fight like that, I was I was very proud of myself. Um, yeah. Able to take out Matt Mask right after that. So I, that, that, I believe it showed where I'm at, you know. Yeah. I think you're on the verge of not being considered an underdog for very much longer. Yeah, no, hopefully so. no matter who you're arm wrestling. Yeah, yeah hopefully so. That, that'll be good. It seems like no matter what I do, it's always discounted. So um, maybe I after this. <sighs> one. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how they could. I don't know how anyone could say anything that would discount what has been accomplished. Like. Man, you beat the guy. You don't beat the version of the guy. Like it's. Uh, you know, it would be irresponsible for somebody to show up unprepared or anything like that. But. Yeah, very true. I, I had Herman beating you only because I thought he'd get a little bit of a, an angle on you off the setup, and then. Um, but I believe every match would be a war because it seems like your sticking point is an incredibly, incredibly strong sticking point that everyone needs to, seems to have struggle getting through, even if they beat you. Um, but man, when you got on your attacking side of the table, and Herman has a de decent defensive game, but when you got on your side of the table with your um, power behind it, he just had nothing, and that that was that's what I, what I, I was shocked with. Um, yeah, and I can see why using Todd Hutchins as a template um, is something you've done because your your uh, your side pressure is definitely definitely impressive. I really appreciate that. Yeah, um, Herman had a lot more strength than a lot of people realize. You know. But we neither one of us after that match performed very well in the tournament because okay. we just well I mean it was like we both had just been in a car wreck you know it was it was brutal but uh you know that's he I, he had super heavyweight hook strength most okay. most people that hook with me I blow right through them and uh, he had way more strength than than most supers he's uh there wasn't a there wasn't a place you know if somebody was to say where where should I attack Herman. He, uh, he doesn't have a weak spot, really. You see solid everywhere. It's kind of like Ron, pulling Ron. There's not a, a, a place where I could say, hey, you could attack Ron here. He's vulnerable. There's not. And he's just solid everywhere. He's one of those guys that's been genetically gifted, A, and then B, they're smart and have trained for so many years that if you're going to beat them, you're going to have to beat them. There's not a, there's not a, nowhere to pick on. You know, you just got to beat them somewhere they're good. Yeah. 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 I would say that with Herman, you'd want to flatten his pronator. But, I mean, that's not done very easily with, with someone of his level. Um, same with Ron Bath. Um, right. they, they have incredibly strong hands and wrists. That's what they're noted for. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 All right, gents. What else we got? Somebody's trying to troll you in the comments section, Gabby. We won't pay attention to that. But Adam Wilmot does say that he wants an hour with us. Maybe we can arrange that. Why not? Yeah. I'd watch it. <laughs> yeah. So, Paul, we talked about what you got next. Anything you want to plug on the show? Um, You know, I'll give uh, an honest uh, shout-out. A lot of the progress I made, I know when I first started arm wrestling, um, I was always strong, but I was getting my hand busted back by just about everybody. They were like, just top rolling. And uh, I would, honest to goodness, give out uh, Country Crush using their handles. And the combat arm sports table, that uh, power pull table, ninety percent of the of the work I've been able to put in and, and get my hand strong enough to to stop all these top rolls. I'd say to invest in a Raptor grip or a Country Crush two inch um, to start out with, and and use it a lot, and um, it, it will help without a doubt uh, strengthen your hand and wrist. 
So I, got a, I got a personal question for you, Paul. If you need to strengthen your hook for a super match, non arm wrestling table like practice um, atmosphere, what do you do in the gym to increase your 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 lock, your your hook lock in the gym? What is your uh, exercise? Well, uh, have you ever seen uh, Dave Chafee where he's training and he's got about four or five plates on the hammer strength curl? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's one thing I do. Um, a lot of Real heavy partial reps, either with a heavy dumbbell, um, uh, with a fat grip. I'll do it maybe with a 120 to 150 pound dumbbell and uh, get in. You know, and I, I, my one of my goals was to work myself up to where I was using the same weight I saw Dave using for the same reps. Um, and and on the end of each set, doing a lot of hard static holds. So some type of partial um, heavy, if you can work a fat grip in there on it too, uh, curl. Um, but not on a table. I found that doing it on a table is kind of rough on your elbow, the table curl, but doing it on a decline and, and just doing that, go to about 90 and work your way back up. And then um, a lot of uh, – uh, one of my favorite exercises is getting a – or one of the ankle straps that you see women put on their ankles and hook to the cable pulley at the gym and do the side kicks and stuff. Mm. You put that on your wrist and get a stupid amount of weight. 150 pounds or so or, or you know, I had to work that's what, about where I'm at now I've worked myself up to over the years get back and you got to break it and walk back and keep your lock and hold it for a minute or so and, and change angles but don't let it move your arm at all work that static strength and uh, I found that helps tremendously those, those are two big exercises um, my raptor grip on the power pull table just kind of pulling a lot of different heavy angles um have light days and heavy days but uh the static strength i built doing those uh where i get a just a, a, the, the ankle strap put around my wrist and work on that that holding power mm -hmm. uh, i see a lot of people go and they'll hit and they just hit a wall you know a lot of people get in there and i, I attribute a lot of that to it seems like when i added that to my it was something i saw travis doing on one of his training videos there was he was holding uh, two people were pulling a rope that he had t kind of attached to his wrist with one of those. So I kind of modified that into using it on a cable and do it a lot. Um, mm. it's, it's where I, I do it uh, at least once a week, real mm. heavy, and just hold it sometimes up to two minutes, just stupid weight, and keep changing the angle, but don't let my, my elbow come past 90. Interesting. Yeah, that static strength lock, I believe, is, is where it's at. Absolutely, uh, right. have, you know, a lot of pull-ups too. Um, but holding holding the lot for a long time at the, at the top. I think I know the answer to this already. But Brandon Justice says, "Would you pull Dave?" Dave Chafee? Yeah, in a heartbeat. I'd love it. I jump. Would you? <laughs> There's more to the question now. Would you pull Espy? Well, yeah, well, yeah. We talked about that a little bit last show. Yeah, I definitely. I, I, there's nobody I wouldn't pull. How about Chris Covey? Coming from a cage fighting background, you know, it's, I'm not scared to lose an arm wrestling match. You know, uh, it's it's fun. I enjoy it. I want to, I want to pull the best, baddest dudes out of there. If I if I lose, then I'll learn something from it. You know, but uh, I just enjoy it. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's really nobody I wouldn't I wouldn't jump on pulling. In my mind, there are people that I realistically think I could beat, and the people I feel like I'm still a year or two out from. Um, but you know, in all honesty, I, there's, there's nobody I wouldn't jump at to pull though. And that's why you're probably going to be the man someday. No yeah. Doubt. If I, if I do lose, I'm going to learn from it, you know, and figure out what happened and I, but I'm not afraid to take a loss. You know, it's, it's not a big pride thing for me. I'm, if you beat me, I'll shake your hand. Uh, you know, I'm definitely a good sport about it you know, and figure out what happened and try to get better. You can't you can't learn if you keep winning all the time. If you don't ever push yourself and you avoid certain people because you're afraid of them or you don't think you honestly could beat them, but you know why not try? You know, uh, I was probably the only person in the room that thought I could beat Matt Mask. You know, in my mind, I honestly thought I could. There was five or six hundred people watching, and I shot the world. You know, you got to believe in yourself and keep it realistic. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. All right, boys, we're sitting at an hour. Sounds good. 
Well, so, I enjoyed it. It was an honor. I really appreciate y'all having me on. Um, thank you for coming on. We appreciate you. Well, thank you. Keep kicking ass, buddy. Absolutely. Pleasure meeting y'all. Have a great evening. All right, gentlemen. All right, bye.